welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That'll inspire Apple to promote us a little. And of course, you can also promote us by telling people about the podcast on social media or however else you publicize the things you like. Now, you can support the Virtual Memories Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. You'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Welcome to the last episode of 2018 and the 300th episode of the Virtual Memories Show. I know it's just a law of round numbers thing to, to celebrate the 300th episode, but but it's a milestone. And um, that's why I want to thank every single guest who's been on the show. This podcast is a conversation, not a, a monologue, despite what these intros sound like. And without the artists and writers and cartoonists, musicians, editors, translators, professors, publishers, and, and all the other creative people who've who've given me the gift of an hour or so of their time and their lives, I'd be nowhere. So thank you for making the time, for answering my questions, for asking me questions, and for making conversation with some schlub from New Jersey. This is the best non-paying job I could have asked for. Now, let's get to the show. I was racking my brains this fall for super special guests for for number 300, trying to figure out how I'd I'd get to the UK to record with Alan Moore or how many arms I'd have to twist to get to Sir Tom Stoppard while he was here in New York working on The Hard Problem or Robert Crumb out in France or, or one of my other Mount Rushmore guests. And then something funny happened. I was on Twitter and I saw that Gary Clark had posted a photo from a a New York City recording studio. So I dropped him a line and I said, I'm that guy who's hit you up about a podcast a few times over the years, just wondering, are you in New York and would you have time and interest in recording a conversation with me for the show? And he wrote back to say he was definitely up for it, that he'd followed the show through the the weekly email that I, I send out. And we got together the weekend after Thanksgiving. Now, of course, some of you might be asking, Who's Gary Clark, Gill, and why are you that into this one? Well, Gary Clark was the singer-songwriter of one of my favorite singles of all time, Mary's Prayer, by the band Danny Wilson. And I first heard that song in the radio more than 30 years ago, and it instantly took up residence in my soul. Uh, Gary's angelic voice, the the pure pop sensibility of the music, it... It just hooked me the way the, the the best songs do. So I've been a fan of Gary's music, and that means Danny Wilson, solo work, other bands, the songwriting and production he's done, and the little side vocals he did, like the song Burn by Lauren Christie. All of that stuff started when I was like 16, and I'm going to be 48 next month. So this is as good as a lifelong interest as I'm going to get. Now, when I was getting this podcast off the ground in 2012, I reached out to Gary, I I think by Twitter, although he may have had a website and I may have had an email for him, to see if he'd come on, um, because he was an artist and I I wanted to have a conversation with him. And he was kind enough not to say no, and 
Over the years, I'd occasionally check in to see if he was in New York or available when I was going to be in London or L.A., um, but we never managed to connect until last month. And then, um, then we recorded. And on the drive home after that, I thought, Gil, if this podcast is about the creators who mean the most to you and who actually say yes, then there is no better guest for number 300 than Gary Clark. And here we are. Now, I, I only know I only mentioned the one song, Mary's Prayer, but Gary is not a one hit wonder from the 80s. He has had a, a successful songwriting and producing career. Um, like I said, he had a bunch of albums, uh, solo, Danny Wilson, etc. And he's also on an upswing right now uh, after the success of this wonderful movie called Sing Street from 2016, uh, where he wrote a bunch of the song. Well, he wrote all the songs that are in it. Um, there, are, well, the movie takes place in Dublin in the eighties, and Gary will talk about it. Um, but he wrote all these these wonderful eighties pastiche songs, like the the hit "Drive It Like You Stole It," um, and that sort of opened a lot of doors for him, and it's what brought him to New York uh, for this this session. He's got a bunch of projects going, and well, I was just really happy that he could set aside an hour or so for a, a talk and. When I was on the way out from the apartment he was he was staying in, I just said thank you for everything all these years. Now, here's a bio for Gary, which is mashed up from Wikipedia, allmusic.com, and some of my own damn uh, conversation. Gary Clark is a Scottish musician, songwriter, and record producer. As a performer, he's best known as the front man of 1980s pop band Danny Wilson, which scored a hit with Mary's Prayer in 1987. After a second Danny Wilson album, Bebop Mop Top, he made a solo record, Ten Short Songs About Love, in 1993, and was later a founding member of the short-lived bands King L and Transistor. Gary found greater success in the years hence as a songwriter and producer, having written and produced songs for Natalie Imbruglia, Nick Carter, The Veronicas, Little Hours, and The Excerpts, among others. He composed and co-performed the music for John Carney's 2016 film Sing Street and is the producer of Heights on his label Blinding Heights. He is currently helping adapt a musical version of Nanny McPhee with Emma Thompson. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Gary Clark. So I guess we can go with the obvious opening question. What brings you to New York? Um, I'm working on a TV show for Amazon that is all the showrunner, uh, writer, director, or um, executive director is John Carney, mm -hmm. who did the Irish film director who did Sing Street, which I did the music with him a couple of years back. So it's a project with John. And how did the um, actually you talk a little about Sing Street and how it happened for you mm. and you know the after effects thereof? Well, Sing Street has actually changed. I mean, dramatically changed the direction of my life and my work, um, and it was kind of purely coincidental or sorta. Of. Um, so, Sing Street was set in the eighties. It's based on a true story. John, the writer-director, um, was really writing about his experience as a kid growing up in the 80s in Dublin. Mm -hmm. And it was really a tribute to his brother, Jim. And Jim, when John was a kid, used to turn them on to all these cool records. I say cool, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Yeah. But the, um, one of the records that he had played to John when he was a kid was my band's first album, Meet Danny Wilson. And John says he remembers cycling to school with a yellow sports Walkman on, which I had one as well. <laughs> and um, and so he was calling people whose records had been at th that kind of pivotal, influential period in his life that his brother had had um, you know played to him, and asking them to do a song each for this movie. And then he sent me. He, he called me out of the blue, and he sent me a bunch of briefs, I think six or seven briefs, all which were hilariously funny and really good. And then, um, and I just picked one at random, really. Or it was the first one I went, oh, I could do something like this. And I wrote a song called Dream For You and sent it back to him. And he loved it. And he said, why don't you just stay on and do the whole movie with me? And I, I was like, wow, that'd be great. 
of course, Dream For You never made the movie. And <laughs> so the song that got me the job landed on the cutting room floor. But um, that was how it came about. So that we can both date ourselves. I will point out that you once did a song called Don't Believe in Hollywood, That's where true. this sort of thing, you know. And then I moved to Hollywood. So. Yeah, that sort of becomes the, the case. <laughs> and it, uh, so you ended up writing all of the 80s pastiches in the movie? Yeah, I mean... And how much of that was coming from your side versus John's a bit of script both. and angle for it? A bit of both. I mean, for instance, the the two songs that I wrote alone, that, that not with John, were Drive It Like You Stole It and um, To Find You. And Drive It Like You Stole It, the brief, I still remember it. It was really great. It was... This is a prom scene. It's an, it's, an, it's an imaginary American prom. It's going to play like a music video. Uh, it needs to be kind of upbeat. It needs to be positive, and it needs to be influenced by Hall and Oates and Huey Lewis and the News. <laughs> and I was like, that just sounds like the best <laughs> afternoon ever. I'm in, you know. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and, and, and Huey Lewis and the News always had those. Punchlines, you know. Yeah. Um, I always think of Shania Twain. She has them as well. You know, that don't impress me yeah. much. Or, you know, uh, man, I feel like a woman, you know. And that's, I, I, the, my first thought was I need a punchline. So I literally went through, you know, I always keep notes. And now they're on phones, but there used to be bits of paper everywhere. And I just was just flicking through them and I saw Drive It Like You Stole It. I don't remember where I saw it or where it came from, but I, I just went, that's, that's the one, you know. So. And just getting back into that 80s mode was yeah. natural for you? Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, I was, I was more 80s in Sing Street than I was in the 80s. That's what I was wondering, because you know. Meet Danny Wilson's a very out-of-time... Mm. It, it, it's, it's a kind of eclectic record, and, it, yeah. and, it's, and it's as much influenced by sort of 60s Bacharach and David and 70s Steely Dan and stuff than it is by what was going on in the 80s, I'm not saying we weren't aware of what was going on, we were, but the, um, if anything, it was kind of a backlash to just, towards the end of the 80s, every hand had become so super kind of tight and produced and polished and sparkly and synthesized that it was kind of a, we just wanted to get back to some of that rawness, you know. And accordion. I was listening to the album again on the drive. Badly played accordion. I'm sure my brother wouldn't mind (laughs) admitting that he's not. (laughs) Yeah, what was your musical upbringing? Uh, Uh, Influences, but actually, you know, getting involved in music when you. I wasn't trained, but I just knew from um, the earliest I can remember. I I, I used to sing constantly. My mum and dad had recordings of me singing when I'm like two and three years old. Um, The I got a guitar when I was eleven. But I'd begged for it for about three years before that. Um, I just knew, just music was just my thing. I just I still feel the same about it, to be honest. You know. Yeah, it, it was actually something that occurred to me this morning. Um, you were recording through the mid '90s. Um, you've been songwriting and producing for other acts mm. since. Since Danny Wilson began, have you had any job that wasn't involved in? In music? No. Good. Okay. I kind of thought that was the case. I'm quite sort of just, you know, privately proud of the fact that I've never worked a day in my life, really. So, I mean, all I ever really wanted was to have a life in music, and that's what I've managed to, you know, sustain and achieve. So that's, um, you know, I can't ask for more than that, really. Yeah. Um, I saw Tom Jones, uh, oh, God, about 15 years ago in Las Vegas, of course. Right. And... um, he thanked the audience for keeping him from ever having to work an honest day in his life. And, and that was... Tom knows the truth. Yeah, at that point he was 64, 65, and yeah. you know, still cruising along. Women were still throwing panties to him on, on stage. And uh, Our friend um, Lisa is actually now tour managing for Tom Jones. That's just happened in the last year or so. And she's, <laughs> so um, I, I can tell you on good authority that he's actually a really good guy. And she loves working with him. And he's, he's still married to his... Or he was... I believe so. Yeah, I yeah. Didn't ask that question. No, no. I, I think uh, the only thing I was going to say, I, th- I thought his wife may have died, but I think he was yeah, long-term a long marriage. Time, yeah. yeah. So, given all the sex symbol 
stuff, which I'm sure you had to deal with also. As oh, yeah, I'm still dealing with that on a daily, daily basis. Yeah. Did, were there aspects of the, of the performing life or the, well, the being a pop star or pop musician that didn't appeal? As oh, sort of massively. I, I sort of realized, you know, when all I wanted to do was make music my life. And then I worked so hard to get to that point where I was like, this is a possibility. And then we had records going out into the world. We were having hit records. And I, I kind of just felt, oh, all this other stuff I don't really want. You know, what I wanted was, I guess, making the music is the bit that's exciting for me. Mm -hmm. And there's so much goes on around being a recording artist that has nothing to do with that. The interviews. Yeah, <laughs> you said sitting doing an interview. Jersey. I don't do many of them nowadays, Gil. <laughs> um, some weird guy shows up from the <laughs> um, You know, they, but the there whole, was so the much time, thing. like you would, yeah. you would get on a, um, you get on a bus and drive around radio stations and get asked the same questions again and again. And I know that sounds a bit disingenuous, but it, for me, it was just taking me away from doing what I wanted to do. And I found that I couldn't write on the road. I found the road really difficult to write and noisy. And, you know, um, and I remember being on a, a tour bus. I think we were going through Sweden. I just remember it was like snow for days. And I think I'd been on this tour bus for about two days. And I just remember going, I, I can't do this anymore. I just don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. And, and it's the studio really had become... I'd put a studio in my house around the time of 10 short songs, so I kind of had this place to go and hide and just do what I wanted to do. And part of the thought process behind putting the studio, because I basically took my record in advance, and instead of spending it in wherever townhouse or these big studios in London, I took the money and, and bought a mixing desk and a tape machine and um, some microphones and did some soundproof work and I basically put a, a studio in my flat in London and it kind of gave me this um, ability to make music without having to ask anybody's permission mm -hmm. or for a budget really yeah. so I could do it whenever I wanted to which was all which was pretty much all the time and <laughs> um, and that I think was the trigger or a big part of the trigger anyway the, the, on that tour bus in, in Sweden kind of all kind of came together and I went I, that's where I'd rather be I'd rather be there making new music than be sitting on this bus to drive two days to play something that we made two years ago you know mm -hmm. and, so. and how did that work then in terms of well I mean you evolved from again doing music with the solo King L uh, mm. and the weird transistor thing that happened yeah. um Versus writing for other acts and producing. Well, it happened kind of gradually. A few, a few artists kind of approached me when I was still making records um, as an artist and asked me to write with them for their own records or whatever. One of the first ones was a girl called Lauren Christie, who was English but I, signed yeah. to um, an American label. I think she was signed to. Was it Polygram or something? I can't remember. Um, and she was making her first album, and it was towards the end of her first album, but I remember she came up to me. Um, there used to be a, um, a night... There's a club that still exists in London called The, the Borderline, and every, kind of thing, two weeks or so, Neil Conti, who was the, the drummer in Prefab Sprout, used to run an open mic night, and it, the band were just fantastic. It was all, like, great players who were all in great bands. And um, I'd go along to watch, and then sometimes they'd ask me to get up and sing. And I remember meeting Lauren there, and she said, I'm almost finished this album, I need, like, one or two more songs. How would you feel about writing? So that was kind of one of the first writing sessions I did. And she went on to be... Basically, I did. I then did her whole of her second album. Breed, right? Breed, yeah. And, and then she kind of went on to be a really well-known writer and producer herself. Um, she did Avril Lavigne stuff and Complicated and I'm With You, so many things. I mean, she's doing Baby Rexha and stuff now. 
but she, because we, she and I were really good pals, we kind of um, experienced a lot of that stuff together, that transition from being an artist into working and writing with, with other people. And um, realised that we actually both got a lot out of it, I think, yeah. is the word. I mean, the there's a... There's a kind of liberation to it. It's, it's interesting because it doesn't sound like there is. I was going to ask because it's not my voice, it's someone else's voice. To me, honest, as an outsider, yeah. I feel proprietary about that. But for you, it's a career. And no, I mean, I, just, I, I should probably show you some of the stuff I get sent. on Because uh, I constantly get sent, now with social media, anybody can get in touch with me. And I get sent these. I got one again last night. Probably get about three a week. And it's people who are absolutely... Furious with me that I don't sing anymore, you know. Well, I, I deliberately did not put that in my question. I figured you get hit with that all the time, but you know, I can ask. So, uh, no, I, so I, it's a it's, it's a, a controversial uh, subject, but the but the it's a different process. And what's liberating about it is that you don't have to be yourself in a way. You know, you can bring as you could bring tons of yourself to the party, but you're really trying to. Um, help somebody kind of, you know, do the best that they could possibly do and kind of elevate their thing. So it kind of takes you out of yourself and it stops being so, I don't know, myopic and kind of self-obsessed. And, you know, it's 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 kind of, it's a different process, but it's still a really creative process. Yeah, do you remember a first instance where you felt you really captured someone else's voice? Or was it that, that Lauren Christie moment? Mm, or did, you know, did it take a while before you really felt comfortable... Ooh, the, the, the outside well, Lauren for sure, but the but the big one for me was uh, Natalie and Brulia's second album, oh. um, because it was the first. You have to do a lot of. I mean, if you want to get into that world, you have to do a lot of sessions with artists who are kind of either on the way up or on the way down to sort of get your foot in the door, get to know managers, A and R guys, get to know who you are, what you do. And it takes time before they're going to allow you into the room with an artist who's, you know, at the top of their game. And Natalie had just basically come off of um, the biggest, one of the biggest records of the 90s with Torn mm. and um, Left of the Middle. And I met her manager through a friend of mine and then subsequently kind of forgot about it and then got a call saying that she was working on album number two and she'd written a lot of songs but she wasn't happy and she was still trying to find a collaborator so we got together and it's funny because I saw Natalie recently and I, and I reminded her of this she couldn't remember but she, at least she thought it was funny but the very first thing she said to me when we sat down to write was I'm into angst <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I was like, you know what, in life or in music, you know, like this could go anywhere. Uh, it's not a great pickup line. I'll no, be honest. It's, it's, it's tough. You know. <laughs> and there's a song on the album called Butterflies, and I kind of had the guitar part to that, and I just started playing the guitar part, and, she, and thankfully she went, oh, I love that, and instantly started singing ideas against it. And I ended up doing like most of that record with her, and many records with her after that. But that was the first. Um, the first time, first time that everything felt. just seemed, felt it into place, you know, yeah. and clicked, and and was a hit as well. So mm -hmm. you know, which helped. <laughs> yeah, what did you have to learn about songwriting? I mean, again, listening to meet Danny Wilson an hour ago, it's it still stands up really, really well. But thank you. But what do you feel you've? Uh, had I, to learn I'm to still back? learning, yeah. and, and, and every single day, um, there's so much to learn. It's unbelievable. Most of it has taken stuff away. Mm -hmm. And getting to the the crux of why should this song even exist? <laughs> you know, like what, what what is this thing, and why why? Um, this, the, uh, one thing that's interesting about um, doing what's as I said earlier, this left sharp left turn into the the world of film, television, musical theatre, is that you're writing for characters. So it's almost related to what I was saying when you're writing for another artist, that you're looking at their life and what they want to say and what they need to say um, musically, but also lyrically. In the sense that when you're working, you know, because at the moment I'm writing Nanny McPhee as well with um, Emma Thompson for the stage. 
And that's a complete fantasy piece, as you can imagine. And so, you know, that why should this song exist is actually answered in the script. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting, you know. Yeah, like with, with something like Sing Street, was there a level of interaction with John mm, over uh, you know, over the you know the development of not the development of the character like you're giving script input but again figuring out what the motivation really is well, well that, it was that, that was a wonderful thing about working with John first of all John's a really good songwriter in his own right and he's mm. a really great musician as well um, he was the bass player in the Irish band The Frames um, before he got into filmmaking or made filmmaking in his life and so he understands music. I don't. I haven't, I haven't worked with that many other people, but I, I, I don't know if there's anyone else quite understands the way John Carney does the kind of interaction between film and music, and music and film, and film and music, and music and film, and it's a constant um, kind of rebalancing of those two things that goes on right the way to the end. And, and lyrics as well. And he's, and he's, um, he, d- he doesn't write lyrics so much, but he'll have great ideas and he'll have great, um, concepts. Um, but he's very trusting of me when it comes to lyrics. And, but he'll also tell me straight when he doesn't think something works, which is really helpful. Um, because passive aggressive is death. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, there's well, none of that. So he's Irish and I'm Scottish. So we just t- <laughs> tell it like it is, you know, it's just like, um, which is, um, but in terms of that movie and, and subsequent things that I've been working on with John, um, what was really exciting for me on Sing Street is that I would write a lyric and he would take something from that lyric and unbeknown to me, he would go away and plug it into the script. That's earlier. what I was wondering, whether it was two-way. And that's because yeah. it felt like that from everything. So he would, he, would, he would put words from the lyric into someone's mouth earlier on in the story. So when the lyric came up, it had some kind of context, which I just thought was absolutely brilliant. And um, but it's, it gonna, was, it's gonna spoil you for experience with with anybody else. Probably, yeah. I mean, I'd have to say he does um, really. There is something special that he does with music and film that I think there's very few people manage to capture. And also that I think he gets. He gets the humour and romance balance correct as well, mm-hmm. I think. Which is, I've always felt that. I've always felt that, that about songs. I mean, Danny Wilson's songs—they're kind of quirky. There's a lot of humour in them, really. Mm-hmm. I mean, Five Friendly Aliens and stuff. You know, there's <laughs> yeah. some weird stuff like Shelley MacLaine. And I mean, um, but it's. So I used to, I used to always love in films when when the. When you laugh with a character, you care about them so much more, you know? Yeah. And when something bad happens to them after that, it really gets you. And, um, yeah, John has that balance really brilliantly. It's great, so... And you're working on an Amazon project with him? Yeah. Um, It's Modern Love, which is a a column in the New York Times Sunday supplement that's been running for a long time. Um, And all of these are stories or based on stories that were in new, this New York Times column. Um, Actually, you, you mentioned the musicals thing. Um, a, how did it originate? B, how does that sort of writing differ from the other songwriting you've done? Uh, how did the musical stuff originate? Well, yeah. but it's, it's I assume again, it's all... Sing Street, but... Yeah. It's, well, Sing Street is, is the thing that opened the floodgates, in a way. The... Um, the producer on Nanny McPhee, Lindsay Duran, who's in LA, saw Sing Street and saw something in it that she really loved. And I think she, I remember her saying to me that she just loved it. It was so uncynical. And um, it really touched her in that way. And that's why she called me about the Nanny McPhee thing. And I'll be honest, when she called me, I was, I, my first feeling was, I don't think I'm right for this. And an element, I guess, of panic. Um, because it's a different type of songwriting? Or? So far out, like, just writing for these fantasy characters in a fantasy time and place. I don't I don't know what it was, really. I just... I, don't, I, I, I guess it was just fear. But I, I... I didn't know this, but Emma Thompson spends a lot of time in Scotland, and um, 
So Lindsay said to me, Emma's going to call you. And the crazy thing is, I've got a really good friend who's, whose daughter's called Emily and his second name's Thompson. <laughs> and I, and I, my phone went um, and I wasn't around it. And she left a message saying, hi, it's Emma Thompson here. And I, I'm in Scotland. And I immediately thought, what, what is Ali's daughter doing in Scotland? Yeah. And I thought, so I phoned her back. And as the phone was ringing, I went, oh, I'm actually calling Emma Thompson. <laughs> so when she answered, I was a bit like yeah. uh, disoriented. <laughs> and she said, I'm in Scotland. Um, why don't you come and um, just see me hang out and we'll just talk about this? And we did. And she just scribbled some in front of me, scribbled down some lyrics and I just, I loved her. I loved her energy. I loved her ideas. And then the ideas for the songs were exciting to work on. Like the first, one of the first ones that she gave me was called, Is It Wrong to Eat a Baby? <laughs> 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 and I just, I, you know, I've got to write that. So um, who could not want to write that? Um, and that's been, you know, that was probably two and a half years ago. It takes a long time. It's a lot of music, you know. It's, mm-hmm. But in in terms of like coming from pop music, it's it's around three albums worth of yeah, it's a lifetime material. Of, of, you know, it's a huge amount of material. But nothing as bad as as those two you two guys doing the Spider Man thing and right. you know going through some ten year odyssey and broken legs and everything else that uh, <laughs> that took to get to stage. Yeah. Well, we're still not there yet. You never know. There might be some broken legs yet. But, you know. Not yours, and that's the important thing. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of the actual types of songs, is it is it different or weirder than well, pop writing? Or is it essentially the same structure or mechanism? Well, I know, one of the things that's kind of... One of the things that I love is that in pop music, there's a lot of pressure to be kind of very current, very much what's on the radio at mm-hmm. a, any particular time. And um, you don't have that so much in musical theatre. Although, I mean, it's getting more and more pop-based musical theatre. Yeah. But um, you've definitely got a lot more wiggle room. And so I can kind of draw on um, influences from pretty much anywhere. So in that respect, it's not too dissimilar from Danny Wilson you know like I'm I mean Danny Wilson there was an element of that writing that was based very much in the records that I grew up listening to that my dad used to play at home so that and that was really the classic American song book you know and the Frank Lessers and George Gershwin George Naira Gershwin and all that stuff and and the kind of classic structures of those songs and I'm not saying everything's like that, but I'm able to dip into but that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, you can use some of those, but yeah. not, <clears throat> not exactly. copy. Yeah, and some show. and some of the the hardest ones to write have been stuff that's much more theatrical. Like there's stuff that you would look you, the, 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 when you get the material. It's you you go this this is not ever going to be a song structure. This has to go through so many changes on stage for it to work. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's going to be seven or eight minutes long, and it, and it's going to change pace and tempo, and it's going to change key, and it's going to you know, and th- those have been the hardest ones to to write and still make them kind of entertaining, you know, or hopefully entertaining. Yeah, <laughs> I imagine the yeah, there's a whole just the structural, you know, almost mm-hmm. mathematical side of it just to make it work, and then yeah. actually convey yeah. something. Um, what do you wish you knew about music and the business in 1986 or so when you were when you were launching Meet Danny Wilson? Uh, are there aspects of this? Or are there things that, you know, man, I wish I did not know this? I, I'm not. I'm a bit of a fatalist in the sense that I don't necessarily, I wouldn't go back and change anything. And so I guess the answer is you've just got to learn each thing as it comes along. And everybody's journey is completely their own journey. Sure. And so... There's no hard and fast, you know, like I get asked quite a lot by young, young artists and musicians, songwriters, you know, how to make it, how to break through, how to whatever term that they use. And there's no answer. Mary's Prayer took a number of attempts that's right. And yeah. there's, I don't want to say luck because it's an amazing and wonderful single that entered mm-hmm. my soul the first time I heard it on, on 
top 40, but it has to, so many things have to break right for something to, to get. That's over. right. And I think um, the, the older I get, the more I realize that, and that, you know, I go back to that phone call from John Carney. It's like I had been, I had been living in LA for the, for something like 10 years before working at the, the, you know, the cool face of pop music and the, it's difficult. It's a hard, hard place to work. You're constantly facing, in fact, rejection. You just get used to it. It's mm -hmm. part of the process. Um, and I hadn't really taken any time off for a real long time. And I, um, we had constantly had to keep moving. We were, we were renting places in, in LA. And I always needed a space for a studio. And my wife, Alison, um, was originally an interior designer. And any place that we moved into should make it look fantastic. And then the landlord would come in and say, I want to move back in again. That happened to us three <laughs> times. And I was like, looks great. Stop, I stay. <laughs> you know? And the third time it happened, um, the guy gave us six weeks to move. And, and it had taken me so long to find this place anyway. We could, I needed, as I say, an outside space, a garage or whatever that I could turn into a studio. And it was just a bit of a blow. And and we had already been kind of getting a bit tired of L.A. We talked about possibly moving to Nashville. And then Alison said, um, would you ever consider living back in Scotland? And I'd never thought about it. And I'd left Scotland when I was 19, you know, and I was now in my 50s. And I, um, it's not to say I don't love Scotland, but I've always kind of followed the music. And the music kind of has been the big music cities like London or LA. Um, and it, the truth is just that one conversation made me realize that most of the work that I was doing, even though I was based in LA and my studio was in LA, was international. So I was working with artists from Sydney, Australia and Sweden and, you know, all over the world. And so um, we kind of had, you know, we thought about it and we thought, do you think it'd be possible to kind of live there and just, you might have to travel a bit more, but I still think a lot of artists would come, come to us. And so we made that giant kind of leap of faith. And when we got there, we bought an old house and this, I decided to take some time off for the first time in a zillion years. And um, I, I knew a lot of the guys from when I was growing up who are now builders. And I said to, I said to them, just use me as a, you know, like yeah. as your assistant or your apprentice you know I'll do anything of course they had me crawling under floorboards and, you know like they, they <laughs> really you enjoyed <laughs> abuse yeah, it really was and and I kind of crawled up from under the floorboards one day and the house was finished and uh, and I got the call from John Carney and I and I, I have this kind of weird feeling that if I hadn't have stopped it wouldn't have happened. Now that's probably complete and utter nonsense, yeah. but it's it's just to do with the feeling of just if you're letting still the all LA that guy go. That, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I just let that go, and it seemed to make a space for new stuff to happen. And, I, and I'm becoming increasingly like that in the sense that I just let stuff happen and try to do the best possible thing I can do with it. You know. Mm -hmm. um, now, my Scotland. I've never vis oh, I've, I've visited once. I was sent on a PR junket to one of the golf courses that Trump owns back when mm. I was a, a trade magazine journalist. So I don't really have any idea, idea. Uh, so all I've got is like early Danny Boyle movies and local hero. Mm -hmm. So you, your place on the spectrum of that is is not too, not too different actually. <laughs> I mean, local heroes. I mean, we're a bit more populated than that. But I live in a place called Brothy Ferry, which is just outside Dundee, and it would have been. A fishing village exactly like that. It's kind of been a bit more built up. And from Victorian times, a lot of the um, factory owners and stuff moved there because they they wanted to get out of the smog of that they were creating yeah. in the city. <laughs> yeah. This place is horrible. We're out of here. Keep sending us money. So, yeah. But I mean, a lot of the year it's colder than LA for sure. But it's, I mean, I walk on the beach every day. I see the beach a lot more in Scotland than I did in Los Angeles, yeah. you know, yeah. where you had to drive half an hour and you know, half an hour back. So, yeah, my wife's Scotland is just Outlander. That's all she's got. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, I told her, no, he, he looks just like the guy from Outlander, honey. That's, that's, you know, so we won't take a picture there or we won't show her anything yeah. after we, you know, yeah. <laughs> disabuse the notions and all. Exactly. <laughs> 
Um, when you're, well, what do you miss about LA and New York when you're home? Um, people and I've yeah. got still got some really good friends in LA. Um, that's definitely the first one. Uh, other than that, I haven't missed it very much to be honest. I mean, I've been back a few times. A uh, couple of things, work things. I went back for a funeral, which was was fun. But yeah. the um, uh, but in you- general, I don't think about it that much, and I, I would actually would say that I'm much happier not being there, um, and I'm much happier doing in the area that I'm working in now that John thankfully took me into. <laughs> they, um, I'm still doing bits of pop music but I'm doing it really on my own terms um, I've started to develop a couple of young artists in Scotland and um, and we've just released this band Heights um, who uh, well when I say band it's a duo but I just think they're wonderful and I've actually kind of worked with Adam uh, one of the guys from when he was at college I saw him playing um, a, a song that he'd written on his own on acoustic guitar and I just started to get him into the studio on weekends and stuff and then he introduced me to his friend Sam who was DJing and doing stuff and it kind of developed into this band and we've just literally on our own label put out the second single this week and it's got um, Spotify's um, New Music Friday playlist which is kind of the modern equivalent of getting played on Radio 1 <laughs> you know? and so the the and it's and it's great because it's I mean it's kind of full circle for me because in a way it's very much Danny Wilson in this in the respect not it doesn't musically sound like it at all but in the respect that it's it's very irreverent kind of pop music it can take from wherever it wants they're, they're quite eclectic the way I was when I was their age and it's so it's you know it's modern but it's magpie at the same time and um, a lot of fun to do and he can sing he's such a great singer so. and you launched your own label as part of this? Yeah, yeah. What went into the decision to do that, and, and what did you learn in terms of, you don't really need all that infrastructure, you just need to be able to do... X, yeah, y, I mean, I've been thinking about it for a long time. Um, I've been thinking about it from even before I got back from L.A. Um, one of the things about L.A., if you were to develop artists, everybody knows who they are because the industry is right there. Whereas my sort of thought process was you could pr- kind of quietly make something brilliant off the radar mm-hmm. and not be kind of constrained by it having a sound like what's on the radio or whatever, you know. Um, and that kind of appealed to me. When I got back to Scotland, there was kind of two things happened. One was that I felt that most of the stuff that I was seeing and hearing was really and I'm not saying it's bad, but it was very roots-based. It was either acoustic folk singer-songwriter stuff or it was very much like the guitar band thing. And there was nothing that I was seeing. I'm not saying I wasn't seeing talent, because I was, but I wasn't really seeing anything that I thought that appeals to me. To Or, I, you know, I could add value. I'd love, value. To, do I'd love to do, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Until Adam kind of walked in. And then there's currently another band that I'm crazy about as well. But the, um, um, I've started to see in that five years that I've been back that change, and I'm seeing a lot more kids now kind of mix, blending that stuff with electronics and things, and it's now starting to feel like a real something exciting's happening there. Um, but the, the, the in terms of the label, uh, I hadn't really found the right stuff, but also my left turn kind of got in the way, and in the sense that I didn't have as much time to concentrate on it as I did before, you yeah. know, like cause working on uh, John's films and musicals and stuff, it takes up a lot of your time. Yeah, I assume that's the so, priority. And I could only really, uh-huh. I, I really would only um, sign things that I think I can give it the time and the love and also mm-hmm. that I believe is worth yeah. my time and energy. So, um, so Heights, I'm really excited about. And as I say, this other new band, but the, um, it's, it kind of coincided with um, another thing that happened. Um, a, f- a guy who I'd known a little bit um, in the music industry, uh, Paul Smarnitsky, decided to move back to Scotland, and he had he had basically been running Universal's Universal Records digital operation for the last ten years, and then 
for two years after that, he'd been running a, a PR company. So he had experience in the bits of the music industry that I had no experience in. Or I, I did, but periphery, really. Sure. I'd always been in, on the... Um, I knew people who did it, but I didn't, you know. And Paul had that experience. He set up Fiction Records, who did Snow Patrol and stuff. Um, really understood Spotify and the whole new streaming world. And he's a good guy, and he's a huge music fan. So he was an obvious fit. So when Paul moved back, um, that's when it all just went, right, we can do this now. So we've been working with him. So. The conceptual question I have for people my age and older, mm. the infinite jukebox. You brought up Spotify. We have all these different streaming systems where we can find any song we want at any time. Yeah. But I had to hunt to get Bebop Mop Top. Back in 1992, and I and I know exactly where I bought Thank that record. You for the hunt. Yeah, and it was the Tower Records in Lincoln Center, which is all gone because Tower mm. Records is yeah. gone. I did order your solo record and the Danny Wilson Double Greatest Hits album with the great cover of Kooks by David Bowie oh, good, you online. But those were those were part of that era where you could start just pushing a button to get whatever you wanted. Mm. Do you see that affecting? those kids today and and music in terms of the lack of scarcity the flip side is you know everything's out there and you don't know what to listen to okay, so the, f- the, the first physical thing that comes to mind is that I am constantly amazed by this phenomenon and that is when I work with a, a young artist for, oh any age artist but when I work with an artist for the first time Usually the first thing we'll do is have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and start listening to records, start listening to music. Because I'd want to get under the skin of like what makes you tick, what do you love, you know, and and also just get in the mood and get excited about music and we're, what we're going to do. And so I have been absolutely stunned at these, like a 19-year-old kid will come in and I'll say, what have you been listening to? Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, <laughs> Paul Simon, you know, like Johnny Mitchell, and I'm there before my time. Yeah. <laughs> what What do you mean? I mean? You're supposed to be turning me on all this all new the, stuff. Yeah, you latest, know? Latest, <laughs> you're, yeah. you're supposed to be keeping my mojo alive, <laughs> and you're bringing me this old stuff. So it, it, it has had this kind of I don't know what you would call it, but it's it's, it's that nostalgia, exactly. I mean that infinite. Availability, if 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 it means you end up gravitating to the best stuff, like the stuff you were just mentioning. Yeah, I mean, but that that brings me to another question: Is it the best stuff, well, or does or or uh, you know, you just asked the question: Is it tied into the whole mythology and nostalgia? So it probably is to a certain degree. I mean, I know, and I'm, I keep meeting these kids that just blow my mind, like how talented they are, you know. And I think song structure and stuff has evolved it's different you know hip hop has changed a lot of certainly in pop music doesn't we are now looking at tracks that change chords very little compared to in the 70s and 80s the chords don't move very little it doesn't mean it's less sophisticated because the sophistication is in how the melody and the rhythm of the vocal can constantly keep you interested on that kind of solid bed of harmonic stuff. So you, you, you can argue it's better or it's worse or it's, it doesn't, it's a pointless argument, really. It's getting a... There's still amazing music being made. You know? And in the role that you have, those goddamn kids today is not an opinion you can, you can hold on to and, and actually do what you want to do, which is... You no, know, but I've never really them. felt like that, to be honest. I mean, the, and if anything, quite the opposite. I, I'm... Sorry to speak ill of my dad, but the the one th- my dad was an amazing influence on me in terms of music because he played me all this incredible stuff and and was such a huge fan of songwriters. Then, you know, he would talk about the songwriters and get so excited about it. And I think that was a huge influence on me as a kid. Um, but but pretty much for him, anything good sort of stopped around 1960 or something, yeah. you know? Like, he never got rock music, he never got pop music, he didn't get the Beatles, he didn't get... So, um, it was big band swing and that that era of music 
the Sonatas and the Ella Fitzgerald, which of course is incredible quality, but you can't say it's where quality stopped, you know. And um, so I always had this opposite thing. I just think what I used to argue with them when I got to be an argumentative teenager. I'd say, <laughs> oh, what, right? He just said, God just stopped making talented kids, right? <laughs> Dad, yeah, right, you know. Um, and of course, that's not what happens. There's, it just evolves. And I think, I'm, I actually think it's probably the, the whole. The whole internet thing, of course there's downsides and we're swamped and swamped by so much music, so that makes it difficult. But I think it's opened up a whole new eclecticism. I think it's opened up a whole new... There are bands who have massive careers who don't have to to be signed to major labels. And um, and it's kind of a, a wonderful liberated thing mm. yeah are there recording technologies not the internet particularly but other technologies you wish you had when you were making music in the 80s and 90s uh, things that would well again like i wouldn't really go back and change anything but the but, no, the, but, um, but if we could have done this t- it would have made it a lot easier to yeah. i mean we were always trying to use the cutting edge of what was available at the time and it, I mean everybody says that but it's, but it's true I mean that, like Meet Danny Wilson was one of the first pop records that was DDD uh, which is yeah, recorded digitally mastered digitally and on a digital format um, of course that, or that was the intention of the first half of the record that we made the second half of the record there was a few tracks where they used um, we had different producers and they used tape um, but up until the, the, the whole like half of the al- first half of the album was all done on a digital recorder. Um, the nerd that I am, I, I sought that sort of stuff. Like Peter Gabriel was one of those early ones where you had to find the, the DDD and yeah. it's all, wow, this is all digital because we were cyberpunk kids back then. That's right. Yeah. And we had convinced ourselves it sounded better as well, but mm-hmm. I'm not sure about that now. But the um, yeah, Do you have a big vinyl collection? I do, I, I do. Yeah. yeah, and I, I never, I mean, I guess I... I've got a garage full of CDs. I no longer have a CD player. I do have. I have once. I have a CD burner plugged into my computer for just when I need it to take samples or whatever. But I, um, it's vinyl that I play at home. Yeah, mm-hmm. and kind of always has been, to be honest. Yeah, but as far as technology went, you were far enough ahead that you know today's tools wouldn't have impacted. The uh, way no, you- it, it it definitely would have impacted. It. I don't know. I, I actually don't yeah. know the answer. I, I, I don't think the record would, the records would have been that different. Um, and yet I do. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not a luddite. I'm all, I've always got the latest technology. Although my, we're not sure if that that little mixer is Thunderbolt two or Thunderbolt three, but that's yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm a luddite when it comes to cables. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a cable luddite. <laughs> have you worked with uh, artists who you idolized? Um, I mean, I assume you've had interactions with with artists. You, I try to avoid it. Actually, yeah. the the I always tell the Irvin Welsh story when I recorded with him. How he told me he stood up David Bowie twice because oh, really? he was supposed to interview him, and he just realized I had his posters on my wall when I was a kid. I yeah. can't do this, and just yeah. you know, I was uh, asked to go to dinner once with Donald Fagan. Or invited to dinner with Donald Fagan, and I decided not to do it. Same reason. Yeah, I just there's a, a little element of don't meet your idols, and there's a couple that I've met, and I'm not definitely not going to name that I've been <laughs> that I've been disappointed, and that's kind of oh, who you didn't see me. and it didn't didn't go well. You mean you just didn't like them very much? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm okay. And yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> no, no names. So I just okay, want to no, no exactly. <laughs> The soul of discretion. Um, so, no, it's not. And, and actually, another thing that happened was we were, um, around the time that we were making, it was probably would be the second Danny Wilson album, Bebop Mop Top, um, our A&R guy was also looking after China Crisis, and China Crisis were being produced by Walter Becker. And so they, uh, the obvious leap of imagination from the record company was you guys should be produced by Walter Becker and, <laughs> and you know we, there are it's, I'm saying this without the, the, 
the preamble, but Steely Dan were probably the biggest influence on me as a as a kid growing up sure. in terms of music. Um, and yeah, we 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 turned that down. And you at that point heard the stories of how long it took those later albums to to get made. Actually, no. I okay, because I was just reading so. recently a couple of anecdotes of how insane. Yeah. The you know twelve hour session so they could get one guitar lick out of a guy. <laughs> <laughs> Can't afford to do that nowadays. That's why everybody's working on a laptop. Right. You know? How do you keep up with contemporary sound? Then, if, if the younger artists you're talking to tend to be talking about uh, guys before your time, how do you keep up with contemporary music? Actually, they do, but they also play me a lot of new music okay. as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I and you know, I've got good speakers and stuff in my studio and. I'm constantly amazed at how records continually sound better and better. How can that continue to happen? What, you know, it's just the same frequencies you're dealing with, you know, but you listen to like a Childish Gambino record or something and the speaker's just like, just, like just, it fills every single space and, and it still has loads of space in it. And I go, wow, you know. So I'm constantly um, listening to new stuff and taking bits you know, bits of influence from it, but at the same time trying to do my own thing. So, mm -hmm. Any long-term hearing loss? And you can make a joke about it, obviously, but anything from... Uh, I haven't, not that's been diagnosed, but I'm sure the, I'm sure of suffered just the, some damage. The yeah. late 50s also will bring that upon you, but... Yeah, that's true. But the, probably not as much as a martial amp will. Yeah, I'm going to figure life is a few years it. spent in front of a loud amplifier. Mm -hmm. Now, when you talk about working with the younger artists and them asking, you know, how do you get over, is there anything you bring from the, the Danny Wilson experience? Is, it, does any aspect of that inform, you know, how you relate to, to up-and-coming acts? I think for quite a long time, I was leaving a lot of that stuff behind. And now I don't feel I have to. And I almost feel it's, for want of a word, better word, it's cool again to be eclectic and to be mm -hmm. able to draw from all these different influences and places. Um, and then certainly working with John Carney, he's a huge Steely Dan fan, so and he loved Danny Wilson as well. So there's, I'm kind of encouraged to go and to you dip into that Bring all place, the, the, the roots know. back. Yeah, which is just great fun, you know. Um, uh, the... I mean, I'll go back to the band Heights again. As I say, they, they've they got this incredibly eclectic thing. And that doesn't sound anything like Danny Wilson, but it has the same freedom. And so we can... And I'm, I'm with them, again, I'm, I'm kind of going, you know what, if other people are not using chords, let's use some amazing chords, mm -hmm. you know? And, and it's, it's that, so... Yeah, and the uh, the thirtieth anniversary of Meet Danny Wilson was a a year or two ago. You played with your your bandmates for that, or I know you played a few years earlier for an event. It, we've done a couple of yeah. just little things for friends, and um, we did we all, we did one song at the Ryder Cup. That's um, right. But the but it's really just. Um, Jed, I don't know if you know this, but Jed is now a full-time member of Simple Minds. Yeah. yeah. So he, and they tour, like they are Always touring monsters. It's, He's in it's, Sydney right now, yeah. I believe. Um, and it's just difficult to get everyone together. But we did look deeply into the idea of repackaging the albums, really high-quality stuff, and possibly adding some new tracks possibly doing some live shows around that. We actually went as far as going, because um, the the Virgin catalogue, we were on Virgin Records, that is now owned by Universal. So we there's only like one person left at Universal from those days, which that's, is amazing. That's still some continuity, in yeah. 30 plus years. But. And she's a good friend of mine, Ashley. And so she hooked us up with the right people and uh, we basically negotiated with them to get the use of the catalogue for a period of time. All of that went really, really well. And then 
I, Nanny McPhee came in for me and a tour came in for Jed. And right. it's, that's two years ago now. So we, 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 ideally it would have happened around the 30th yeah, anniversary. Made it but I'm, I'm definitely not saying it would never happen. It's just difficult to coordinate, really. It's not for want of love. Well, know. I do wonder what the what the final version is because I had the American version of Meet Danny Wilson on CD that... I played enough that it actually wore out, and oh. I had to get a, a you UK wore out version. CD. You. I guess the the oils on the fingers or something eventually <laughs> get into the, uh, the 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 coating. Um, and a girl I used to know has a different mastering from the UK version to the US version. Uh, it, it's I funny. think it might even be a different uh, version. The, yeah. the, the and I'm trying. It's difficult to remember the the order of events. But I think it was really a post Mary's Prayer search for another single. One of the things that had happened with Mary's Prayer is that um, it basically it was released three times in the UK. The, the record label really believed in it, and it helped that the U, in the US it had just it's a much slower market here. But basically, it had just been consistently kind of climbing, and so that showed them that you know this is a hit record. The, the, so the they, they felt they believed in it, so they released it once and it went to something like number 45 or something, didn't break the top 40. And then they released it again and I think it got to like number 37 or something. And then at the end of that year, Radio 1, which was the biggest and most influential radio station at that time, um, had a, 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 a listener's poll to vote for the song that they thought should have been a hit in whatever, whenever it was, 1987. Um, and Mary's Prayer won it by some huge margin. And so Virgin said, we got to go back with it again. And I, I'll be honest, I kind of was fighting it. I was like, We're this is forward, getting embarrassing. <laughs> exactly. Let's just make some new music, right? You know, let's go back in the studio. And they thought that to go back to Radio 1, they needed some kind of angle. And so we, they did, we did a remix. Paul Stavely or Duffy did a remix. And that was the record that was a that was a hit in the UK, which this, it's a great mix, but it doesn't sound massively different at all. And you know, you would you'd be hard pushed to tell the difference between the two of them, um, unless you obsessively listen to them to the point of wearing out one CD and having yeah, to play another. Exactly. <laughs> but that I think was that bled into the philosophy of when we need another single and girl I used to know. So let's let's have a reason to go to radio with it. So they did a because the album had been out for a year or something by then. So we did a different version of it with a guy called Glenn Skinner. I'm pretty sure that we'd have been in sort of late 87 or something, maybe even early 88. And so there are two different, they repressed the album with two different versions. Stupid, I, but... I end up with both. There you go. Um, well, there's sort of the opening question. I'm not sure we exactly tackled it. What you're doing and what you hope to get done, or is mm. that uh, under confidentiality? And, and uh, no, not really. No, I'm, I'm. My life is a non-disclosure agreement, so I assume <laughs> everyone else has that too. Uh, well, I mean, they've already announced that they're doing the show and that John's doing the show, so I'm su sure I can talk about it. But the um, the, so the 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 Modern Love Show, it's, a, it's an eight part series. All of the, all of the episodes are half hour long. And the goal is to have at least one original song in each one of these episodes. And obviously there's a lot of score and stuff to do as well. So I've been made executive music producer. And I, whether, so whether I find a song or another artist or whether I create that song is kind of wide open, but it's, it's really dependent on each, um, what's needed. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they're shooting the last couple of episodes at the moment. Stuff's been edited, sent to me, um, and it was I was in S Scotland for a bit of it, and it just felt there was a big disconnect between me being there and the guys who were editing and stuff here. Sure. So I just wanted to be on the ground, and it's been really helpful, actually. And so we booked um, Electric Lady Studios, and, and in between John shooting two episodes, I managed to get a week with John. So we wrote a few songs for it then. And, um, yeah, we're, it's probably going to come out summer next year. And I might even, it, who knows, I might even sing a couple of them myself. But um, Which is always the final question. <laughs> you got to see, I'll be Are you going to be doing some singing? <laughs> now, the last thing, though, I, the importance of studio, individual studios, like, is there a... I don't want to say pedigree, but are there certain studios you just feel like this is the right space to be doing... 
X, Y, and Z. They certainly have, certainly, certain rooms certainly have magic to them, and Electric Lady being one of them. A lot of my favourites in London have closed. My absolute favourite was Olympic. Um, but having said that, I've learned to make records uh, in the modern way, which is with very little equipment and a lot of stuff being done um, in a computer. And there's so much you can achieve now in that digital domain and it brings the cost way down. And of course, there isn't the money in the music business that there used to be because people are not buying physical copies um, and many other reasons. But the, um, the, the luxury of going out to a bigger studio is usually reserved for things that you can't really do at home. So live drums, strings, brass, those kind of things. But, um, you know, because it's a TV show, we have a bit more of a budget, and so we were actually able to go and record rhythm section stuff and things in, in Electric Lady and do a bit of writing, actually, in there, which is exciting. And final question, just because my wife is obsessed with the movie Music and Lyrics. Mm. Don't ask. What comes first? Uh, Music or lyrics? Oh, jeez. That, that's like, <laughs> what does a Scotsman wear under his kilt? <laughs> You're not allowed to tell that. No, it's, it's, the truth is it can be either or. I prefer to have a melody before I dig deep on lyrics because if if you're allowing what's written on the page to tell you what the what the rhythm of the melody is then it's not a spontaneous melodic sort of reaction having said that working with Emma Thompson for instance she sends me tons of lyrics but she's of course really cool and allows me to change the shape of sentences and move things around. Mm -hmm. um, so, in general, I'd say music, but the other, but but concept is almost more important than anything else. And so, for me, you might have the idea for the the lyric, and then dig in musically, and then towards the ends when I start really dotting the i's and crossing the t's on the the lyric itself. Good to know. Gary, thanks so much for your time. It's been my absolute pleasure. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you. And that was Gary Clark. He's on Twitter as Gary Clark Music. All one word. Clark is C-L-A-R-K. Um, you should watch the movie Sing Street to get an idea of his recent work and just how well he can write songs for that that era. Uh, he made two albums with the band Danny Wilson, Meet Danny Wilson and Bebop Mop Top, both of which I adore, still listen to constantly 30 and 25 years later, as well as his solo record, 10 Short Songs About Love. Um, there's also another with a band named King L. Great Day for Gravity was that album, and an album with Transistor, where he doesn't sing much, uh, but they did have the great single, Look Who's Perfect Now. Uh, and he's written and produced a lot of songs since. So make sure you watch Sing Street. Um, it's a wonderful flick. Check out Heights. I did after we recorded, and their two singles are gorgeous. They're wonderful songs. Uh, you can look them up on your favorite music service. Heights is impossibly named as H-Y-Y-T-S. I'm going to put links to all of my favorite Gary-related music in the show notes for this episode. And I will note that in the YouTube playlist to be played in the event of my death, there is a link to the cover of David Bowie's Kooks that Danny Wilson did. It was a, oh God, it was a rarity on the import double CD uh, Danny Wilson Greatest Hits, which gives you an idea of how deep these cuts go. Even though it's a cover... I think it's my second favorite Gary Clark vocal song behind Mary's Prayer. And yes, there is a YouTube playlist to be played in the event of my death. You should have one, too. And when you find somebody you keep, think of me and celebrate. And after we wrapped, I asked Gary, so who you're reading? But he's told me he's had zero time for reading lately. Uh, but if you want to hear my other guest's answer to that question, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memory Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. The third quarter episode features book recommendations and some extra conversation with Moby, Audrey Niffenegger, 
Mark Ulrichson, David Lloyd, Glenn David Gold, Ken Krimstein, Hal Mayforth, Lance Richardson, and Nathaniel Popkin. You can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project, which I swear to God I'll get to, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this one at a crash pad in the West Village. Uh, the toll was like 10 bucks. Parking was about 30. Subway down was three. I had to take a lift back up to the Upper West Side for the garage. That was like 18 bucks or so. So if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Joe Caruso, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizic, Paul Karasik, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Jack Les Camella, Teresa Lewis, Stephen Nadler, Jim Ottaviani, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, Stephen Solomon, Craig P. Steffen, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, Noah Van Skyver, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have the full list of show supporters at ChimeraObscura.com slash VM. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. Hal, speaking of all those guests I was thanking at the beginning of the show, is one of those people who's given me the gift of letting me into their home and sharing an hour or so of conversation with me. Again, on the event of episode number 300, I want to thank all of them and... Thanks to all of you who've been listening to the show over the years. And if you're a first-timer, I hope you're enjoying it. That's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much. We'll be back in two weeks because I'm taking Christmas week off. I've got a few choices for who to kick off the 2019 season with. You'll have to come back and find out who it is. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That'll help us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to episode number 300 of the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. <laughs> <laughs>